Welcome back to another side projects video. We covered the greatest hoaxes in history before. If you haven't seen that original video, definitely go check it out. But the ones in today's video stand alone and are just as good. So don't worry if you haven't seen it. Let's jump in. The morning of November the 19th, 1726, was a Saturday much like thousands of others in English history. It was probably cold, it was probably rainy, because of course it was. The London Gazette published a front page story about the King of Spain naming Duke de Veragras as Councillor of War. Callicus III was named the Patriarch of Constantinople, only to promptly die the next day. As things went for 1726, this amounted to something of a slow news day. It may not surprise us then that this eye raising missive was printed on that same day in the Mist's Weekly Journal of London. To quote From Guildford comes a strange but well attested piece of news that a poor woman was about a month past delivered of a creature resembling a rabbit, but whose heart and lungs grew without its belly. End quote. The woman from Guildford was one Mary Toft, a 24 year old peasant farmer and the wife of a Clothier. Mrs. Toft was already the mother of three healthy human children, which is why, when she found herself with child for a fourth time in the spring of 1726, she continued to work the fields, as was custom for a peasant in 18th century England. However, all was not well. By August, Mary was experiencing severe pain and suffered what appeared to be a miscarriage, discharging flesh and blood. But that was not the end of the matter. Despite having seemingly miscarried a month later, Toft was showing signs of continued pregnancy and would go into early labor once more, this time delivering what appeared to be the flesh of a rabbit, fur and all. And Toft sent samples of what she claimed to be animal parts to a more experienced midwife named John Howard, who examined them. Howard at first ruled out the possibility, but agreed to see the young woman anyway. But as the Mists Weekly would go on to detail, within a few weeks he was back again, and then three more times, as Mary evidently continued to deliver parts of what appeared to Howard to be living creatures. Howard, not a trained physician, apparently identified the parts as three legs of a cat, one rabbit leg, a cat's guts, and the backbone of an eel. By now, the happenings in the humble Toft home had become the talk of the countryside, so much so that Henry Davenant, a courtier of King George I, visited Toft and examined samples that Howard had preserved. Davenant was apparently alarmed by what he saw and alerted Nathaniel St. Andre, a Swiss surgeon, to the royal household. His curiosity thus piqued. St. Andre visited the alleged animal mother in the company of Samuel Molyneux, the secretary to the Prince of Wales, and as if on cue, within two hours of their arrival in Guildford, Mary gave birth to the torso of a rabbit. St. Andre, a trained surgeon, examined the rabbit and determined by submerging them in a bucket of water that its lungs were saturated with air, meaning that the unfortunate rabbit had been breathing before it died. And yet, St. Andre, apparently taken with Toft's story or Howard's enthusiasm, concluded that the rabbit must have come from Mrs. Toft's fallopian tubes. It should be noted that Molyneux was rather less impressed and would later distance himself from the affair, producing diary entries which spoke of his suspicions of a hoax. Later that day, though St. Andre the surgeon was not present, Toft reportedly gave birth to another rabbit torso, uh, which they also examined. And then, yet again later that evening, they were called to Toff's bedside as she experienced yet more violent contractions, at which point St. Andre delivered the head of a rabbit and what appeared to be parts of a cat. Perhaps it was a more innocent age, or perhaps Mary Toft's story was really very convincing, but regardless of the reason, St. Andre appeared to be taken in. Finally, at the apparent urging of Molyneux, the king sent a second surgeon, Siracius Arlers, to render an objective second opinion. Opinion. Finding no signs of a recent pregnancy in Mrs. Toft, Barlas noted her apparent discomfort during an examination. The young woman appeared to be holding something in, keeping her legs tightly closed. Arlas, convinced that the affair was a hoax, returned to London with specimens, which he found upon examination to have been cut with a blade. He was soon called back to Guildford, where Mary Toft had subsequently given birth to yet two more rabbits. St. Andre, meanwhile, had collected sworn statements of several witnesses, apparently in a preemptive effort to defend his initial findings. It was at this point that the King's Court grew open concerned and ordered for the young woman to be transported to London for examination by the knighted obstetrician Richard Manningham. Manningham subsequently watched as Toft delivered what appeared to be the bladder of a hog because of course she did. By now, the story had become a national sensation, with physicians from across England journeying to see the mother of rabbits from Guildford. Writer John Harvey wrote of the affair, Every creature in town, both man and woman, have been to see and feel her. The perpetual emotions, noises, and rumblings in her belly are something prodigious. All the eminent physicians, surgeons, and man midwives in London are there day and night to watch her next production. Now, look, not what you're thinking. How on earth could they be so gullible? Well, in truth, 
many were not. While the media and many physicians were skeptical of the story, particularly given the increasingly suspicious behavior of St. Andre and John Howard, a few saw the apparent medical marvel as proof of a then popular theory known as maternal impression, or the belief that the emotional states or thoughts of a mother might somehow influence the development of a child. However, by early December the 4th, the scheme had begun to unravel. It transpired that Toft's sister-in-law, Margaret, had snuck a rabbit into Toft's chamber in London, but Toft claimed it was solely for eating. Toft was then intensively questioned by a justice of the peace, and after several sessions, confessed to fabricating the entire affair. Following her previous very real miscarriage, which occurred in September of that year, she had inserted animal parts into her womb through her already dilated cervix. Subsequently, she had repeatedly inserted animal parts into her vaginal cavity, producing them on demand. Toft, charged by the king as a vile cheat and imposter, was imprisoned at Tot Hillfield's Bridewell. The scheme, she claimed, had been suggested to her by a wandering gypsy woman who had suggested that the hoax could make her rich. From the pulpit, she blamed John Howard, her mother-in-law and St. Andre, for magnifying the hoax into a national sensation. While Toft was imprisoned, the affair marred the reputation of the medical profession in England, which became the popular butt of many literary and theatrical skewerings in the years that followed. St. Andre, already viewed at court as something of a clinger on to the king, was publicly shamed. Toft, who had become a national figure of fun-making and morbid fascination, was bobbed by fans at Tothill Fields, where she would eventually be discharged in 1727, with her criminal charges being quietly dropped. Little is known of her later life, although her parish reports the birth of one more real human daughter, Elizabeth, in 1728. Step aside, Al Capone's vault, take a seat, Watergate, take a number, Benghazi! This scoop made the rest look like child's play. At least that's what the British press believed when, on April the 25th, 1983, it blared from the Sunday Times front page, The Secrets of Hitler's War, with the lead line, How the Diaries of the Fuhrer Were Found in an East German Hayloft. Hitler's scowling face stared ominously from the center photo, in front of which an academic seemed to be laying out a stack of blank dossiers. The world was in store for revelations never imagined. Inside the mind of history's greatest monster. If only it was so. Behind the headlines was a simpler and more banal revelation. Journalists are not trained historians. The Times' credulous reporting was the public face of a clever but ultimately obvious hoax, the work of a prolific fraudster and forger Conrad Kujau. In its mea culpa, the Times would later admit, serious journalism is a high-risk enterprise. Indeed it is the Times. Although one must wonder how the staid media company's appetite for risk justified it publishing the news that the diaries of Hitler, a man noted by contemporaries never to have taken notes and to have abhorred writing in his own hands, who dictated even his personal letters to a secretary had been found and comprised 62 volumes of handwritten pages. The volumes had apparently first come to the attention of an investigative reporter from the Times' opposite number in Germany, Der Stern. He spotted one of the books in the private museum display of a Nazi memorabilia collector. Immediately recognizing it as the opportunity of a lifetime, the reporter, Gerd Heidemann, set about tracking down the diary's former owner. From the private collector, he learned of an airplane crash in the village of Bornersdorf in 1945 in which the diaries had apparently been involved. The crash, it seems, was real, and some of Hitler's private effects had been on board. The diary, however, was a fraud created years afterwards. Heidemann tracked the source of the diary to a collector named Conrad Fischer. This man was, in fact, Conrad Kujal, the author of the forgeries. A veteran con man, Kujal had also promulgated many other notable pieces of fake Nazi memorabilia, from letters to amateur paintings. It is claimed, in fact, that nearly one quarter of the content of a collection of Hitler's paintings published in the 1970s, Hitler the Unknown Artist, are, in fact, the work of Kujau. In his possession, he claimed, were 61 additional volumes. It's not known whether Kujau had produced the diaries in bulk with the intention of selling them off to private collectors piecemeal, or whether the number was pure fiction. Regardless, Kujau was tempted to contact Heidemann when he discovered that de Stern had committed at least or about $800,000 to purchasing the diaries if they could be found. Though he was secretive and insisted on anonymity through intermediaries, he agreed to sell the diaries to de Stern, which began to receive them in January of 1981. 
One by one, over months, diaries arrived. Heidemann, who may have been in on the scheme at this point, explained that the diaries were being smuggled out of East Germany inside pianos. As more diaries arrived, de Stern agreed to pay larger and larger sums, eventually paying nearly 10 million marks, or about $4 million for all of them. Apparently satisfied by little more than a bit of handwriting analysis, which seemed to confirm the diary's authenticity, de Stern published the story on April 25, 1983. Advanced copies of the story were quoted by Newsweek, The New York Times, and The Sunday Times. None, however, were submitted to any actual historians or experts for proofing. It ought to have been a clue that something was a bit amiss. As it transpired almost immediately, the diaries were not only fakes, but obvious ones. Impressive, if only for their comprehensive nature. Even based on published excerpts prepared by de Stern, historians immediately sounded the alarm, calling the journals immediately into question. This was not all. There was immediate concern about the intentions behind publishing the excerpts. The diaries depicted a kinder, gentler Hitler than the raving lunatic who jumped off the pages of his own poorly written autobiography, Mein Kampf. The Hitler of the fake journals was unaware of the Holocaust, for one thing which the real Hitler certainly was aware of. In fact, this is among the reasons Hitler never kept personal notes of any kind. He always sought to obscure his own involvement in his crimes for posterity. This made the diaries themselves a dubious proposition at best. Later legal wranglings would reveal that de Stern had been the victim of a coordinated fraud, perpetuated at least partially by its own correspondent. Kujau accused Heidemann of skimming much of the profits of the sale of the journals to de Stern and of orchestrating a bogus authentication to secure his prize. In the end, all parties were ultimately to blame. The newspapers were wanting to believe they had the scoop of the century just as much as the forger and the reporter for supplying that story, cock and bull. That was. Not every hoax has to start off with an intent to defraud. In fact, many hoaxes throughout history have originated from a desire to tell a version of the truth. However, at times, and depending on the medium in which a story is being told, poetic license may become inextricably confused with out-and-out -out lies. Such was the case for American writer and would-be gonzo journalist Mike Daisy, when in March of 2012, the arresting story of his visit to the heart of modern China's manufacturing industry was aired uninterrupted on the popular national radio program This American Life. The gripping monologue, told in Daisy's own voice, was called The Agony and the Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, and it was an immediate sensation. The tale, one of heartfelt discovery as Daisy met with and shared intimate moments with the brutally oppressed and exploited workers of Foxconn, an American supplier in Shenzhen City, China, tugged on the heartstrings of millions of listeners around the world. A viral hit on social media, Daisy's story prompted major media attention on the working conditions in China. Daisy's entrancing narrative probed deep questions about the ethics of global supply chains as well as the human cost of modern conveniences from the monologue. But I do know that in my first two hours of my first day at that gate, I met workers who were 14 years old. I met workers who were 13 years old. I met workers who were 12. Do you really think Apple doesn't know? In a company obsessed with the details, with the aluminium being milled just so, with the glass being fitted perfectly into the case, do you really think it's credible that they don't know? Or are they just doing what we're all doing? Do they just see what they want to see? The story affected many. It did not, however, impress one person, a woman featured in Daisy's story. She was dubbed Kathy, Daisy's professional interpreter and local fixer, who described his account of their visit to Schengen as like something out of a movie. Daisy's story made harsh allegations of worker abuse and suicide. It detailed inhumane working and living conditions, in which child laborers were put to work making iPhones and old men were scarred for life by chemical burns. And some of it was probably true. But how much? Well, it's still hard to determine. Despite issuing a retraction and re-interviewing Daisy two weeks later on the same program, host Ira Glass was never able to extract a full and detailed confession of which parts of Daisy's story had been fabricated. Daisy defended his actions as a form of performance art, but admitted that the pressure of having his story selected for publication on national radio had caused him to deceive fact-checkers at the network NPR and to obscure many details of the true story in an attempt to avoid being caught. Still, Daisy argued vehemently that the story told a kind of truth. He continues over the years to defend the piece as artistic license. And perhaps it did tell a kind of truth. 
but it did not tell the truth. NPR was badly mauled by critics who argued that the piece was presented as journalism and a serious breach of professional ethics. Host Ira Glass apologized publicly. Though the story was outed as a hoax, this did not prevent the New York Times from producing a hard-hitting investigative series on Apple's manufacturing practices in China, a series that probably helped put an end to the company's long-standing cooperation with the supplier depicted in the story, Foxconn. So, is all well that ends well? Ten years on, we'll let you decide if Daisy's deception was justified.